Okay, last speaker of the day, and according to the schedule, I've got five minutes. But I'm going to I'm going to take my fifteen minutes because I'm going to try to circle back. We started off yesterday with vision. What do we want to do? We want to be breathing cleaner air. One of the strategies to achieve that vision is the eco. We've heard today a lot about the tactics of different fuels, and I'm going to draw on a particular tactic, LNG, but I'm also going to then talk about the strategic challenges in delivering then the vision of cleaner fuel, and with a particular focus back into Hong Kong and into the environment we know well. So let's run through this quickly. Uh, a few seconds on BMT, who you've probably never heard of. Where are we on LNG? And here, Mr. Carlson has done a lot of my work for me, uh, particularly introducing the environmental benefits of uh, LNG. So that's some slides I don't need. And then particularly um, Hong Kong issues. And this then speaks to the dialogue between a wide group of stakeholders going forward. Uh, BMT um, used to be British Maritime Technology, and now we just stand for excellence. But our expertise has that marine founding, but we work on the land, and we're particularly engaged in the bit in between in terms of ports. Uh, within the LNG field, we're um, doing the engineering of LNG supply s solutions in this part of the world. Uh, we've just recently started on the design of the first FSRU, floating regasification storage <laughs> unit in Africa. So it's a, a particular area of, of interest, bringing the LNG to the port and using it in the port. So. A quick run through uh, LNG activities to date. We've got LNG bunker ports being set up. Every port is trying to say, we can be supplying this fuel to you around the world. Lots more of those are planned rather than actually existing. There's a lot of small scale operations, but these are mainly servicing limited areas. And really only a few sort of large scale type ships that we would recognize as the ships that come into Kwai Chung are in operation. Um, the ones being built at the moment, I think, are Hawaii to the west coast, and they work on a pendulum system within American uh, waters. Uh, obviously, Europe, with its ECAs and SEEKAs and NECAs leading the way in a lot of the LNG bunkering, ferries, patrol vessels, supply boats, this is now hitting the America where they're looking at American supply, platform supply vessels. This is perhaps the most important element for us. New terminals on the Yangtze. Within the last year, a goal of 2,000 self-propelled barges converted by 2015 and 10,000 by 2020. That's a major initiative on our doorstep. And it will need a variety of terminals spread throughout the Yangtze and we will be able to draw on that experience as we try to deal with local emission issues. As we saw from the maps produced yesterday, yes, the focuses for pollution are in Kwai Chung and along some of the major fairways and corridors, but at some places right up into the Pearl River Delta, the only vessels getting up there are smaller scale barges, uh, rather similar to this Rhine barge illustrated there. And, but this is, the, um, this is the future of LNG, maybe. This is perhaps not the beautiful Norwegian shiny <laughs> ship we saw. But this is one of the examples of those Yangtze barges. There's a lot of comfort to be taken by this image, and perhaps this is the most important image of my, my presentation. It's a lot like the things we see out our front door. It's the application and retrofitting of today's workhorse. <coughs> um, it's interesting to note that these barges you know, aren't carrying high-value cargo. So LNG needs to be very price competitive. At the moment on the Yangtze, it isn't, partly because of the supply distribution network isn't there in sufficient volume. And also, we have regulated um, diesel prices in, in China. So, But in Hong Kong, um, Pearl River Delta, we're much more of the higher-value container cargoes than perhaps the building materials and bulk materials. So we have an opportunity of being competitive. But is that the shiny, bright future of LNG? Well, let's, let's hope so. Because you know this is 
uh, more of what we have. And in fact, those slides should have been the other way around. I should have been introducing you the beautiful Norwegian ship first. But this, this is an example of when you start building specifically, you know, hull optimization, material optimization, performance around the delivery with a new fuel system. <coughs> um, here's a graph I've stolen off Lloyd Register. Uh, the left-hand axis is potentially the ocean-going vessel fleet. The lines are these best fit lines here, here, and here. Now, we do a lot of forecasting in my business. And if I was to give you a forecast that in 10 years' time you might have 50 vessels, uh, these are the ocean-going types, or you might have 2,250, you'd probably wondered why you were paying me for that range. Um, but it's a function of the concern in the industry that what's leading, supply, demand, the infrastructure. LNG is considered as one of these really great opportunities for future powering of vessels, but no one quite knows the speed of take up. And that's providing that huge range, you know, 50 to 2,250 ocean going vessels might be LNG powered in 10 years time. Massive degree of uncertainty because everything's a little bit uncertain. Vessel led or port led, market led or government led, which moves first. European approach, typically a bit more coordinated. Uh, government money, European government money. Uh, Gothenburg, Rotterdam are putting in the infrastructure but we've got the confused chicken at the moment. Where are we going to go? Um, just as Ms. Car Ms. Carlson had illustrated, the Rhine is developing a plan for LNG bunkering, and commercial companies are coming on board. Pilot projects, small fleets, all of this very similar to the Yangtze, very similar to um, the opportunities for the PRD. We've got those chances ahead of us of creating the local fleet and the local infrastructure <coughs> that might crack the chicken and egg problem because it suddenly becomes a quick win because of the scale. So we've got to get that infrastructure in place. Government intervention is a way of doing that and is common particularly in Europe and pilot schemes to provide the critical mass. Right, some success. What must be in place? Policy. Clear policies, penalties, enforcements. A bit like we've just seen with the recent fuel switching. Clarity that if this is the rule, it's a simple rule, you break it, you get fined. Regulatory support, so that the full weight of the law can be applied. Price, it's gotta make sense. The propulsion systems have to be able to manage it. The maintenance issues can't be too significant. And price is often created by critical mass. When you see the developments on the Yangtze and you think to yourself, well, you know, when Chinese manufacturers get into things, they really manage to drive down price. Just see what happened with solar power over the last few years. Solar power is now 75% cheaper than it was about five years ago, all because of the economy of scale of Chinese manufacturers getting into it in a big way. So um, shipping lines are traditionally conservative, but with a herd mentality. Th that's true, and it still amazes me, but um, particularly when you're buying things at you know, 100 million US dollars a ship. But you know, oh, he's got one of those. I ought to get one too. But it happens. Like, amazing. Right. And people. Sufficient interest and confidence and vested interests. And here we start broadening out and thinking about some of the local issues in concerns, benefits, land use, and disruption. And then finally physical. And Hong Kong has a number of physical constraints. The technology is there, but what about the infrastructure? And how can that be placed within Hong Kong to deliver the opportunities. We, we have some challenges uh, that I haven't put in place perhaps on governance as well. So we need all of these bits. For instance, 
gas transfer and gas is under EMSD in Hong Kong, Electrical and Mechanical Supplies Department. But if it's on a ship, it's Marine Department, and Marine Department don't really know about gas safety. So what, you know, so it's gas, it's a ship, it's gas, it's a ship, it's a ping pong between the two departments if you're not careful. So we need all of those in place to get ourselves LNG fuel. And we need the, uh, the internal structures within government to be able to say yes. That's a major challenge in itself. So how can we make it happen here? What are we missing? Just to run through those four things, policy. Well, we've got the first policy of, you know, we've started to say, let's improve our air quality. But the regulatory of how we do it, which of those tactics is to be taken forward, isn't there? Price and economics, probably we can be competitive. Critical mass, not there yet. Stakeholder buy-in, acceptance by public, who knows? Technology, yeah, this can be done. And in fact, the Norwegians have really led the way in showing how it can be done at fantastic standards. And the Chinese have shown how it can be done by putting a tank on top and shoving a pipe down to the engine. You know, and in the middle between the two, there's a way that will get you what you need at the price you can pay. And the fueling infrastructure. We need more gas in Hong Kong. We're getting another terminal in Dapeng, so we have the opportunity of bunkering barging into the port. And, uh, and the, we need to find somewhere in our fairways to fit it. Um, we've seen the AIS plots over the last few days. This is actually AIS plus radar, so we capture everything. And that's, uh, that's not every movement in one day. There are about 25,000 vessel movements in Hong Kong on a day. But you can see that we've got this tight regulated land use. We've got no proper formal designations of water space in Hong Kong, whereas every millimeter of land is identified and demarcated in a plan outside country parks, fairways, anchorages. It's a bit of a free-for-all on, on water space. This means that you can't easily say yes to something new. And so often the answer is, well, no, not really. And of course, as this uh, image il illustrates, we're, we're part of a network of transport coming through and into the Pearl River Delta. So it isn't just a Hong Kong issue. In order to get people on board, you need to climb a ladder. And you need to do it together, and it takes time. And last time around, it took seven or eight years. You need to bring understanding and knowledge for decision making. So you can't rush people. You've got to recognize the connections between the pollution and health. You've got to bring people into an, uh, the same position that, hang on, this would be a wise thing to do. So it's part of a process. We're a rather small, intellectual, narrow group here all clever, concerned people, but obviously this knowledge needs to be brought through into the wider community. But Civic Exchange is, is just one group that's shown to be very successful at that. You need stakeholder engagement. You need the industry and affected parties, and we need clear plans of action created from that. Government needs to be brave. How, how many of us have been in meetings where there was really looking for a solution that would create no objections. Well, it's very difficult to find a solution that keeps absolutely everybody in Hong Kong happy, but we need to be able to drive towards a goal and towards a vision. So how may we finally get there? Will we be European, US, or Chinese approach? Specialist vessel-led in Europe? Specialist sort of harbor or pendulum-style systems in the US? In China, it's been the pressure on the major state-owned enterprises and the gas companies. You know, there's a goal, get this going. And they're not making any money, money doing it, but they're following an instruction and a lead, and things are getting done. But we're a bit more complex. We're more international, diverse range. And of course, <coughs> we'll, we'll have the um, move that an ECA needs to be shared between ourselves and the Pearl River Delta. So pl plenty of cross-border uh, jurisdictional challenges. We've got challenges in the whole way that the market is created and how gas is sold. You know, at the moment, LNG is often done long-term contracts from a supplier to a power station, for example, 25-year contracts. 
you know, the small scale needs to be encouraged. You've got to identify how you can bring LNG into congested port areas by landside facilities, by bunker barges, how will that be done? We've got to watch what's happening in the Yangtze River really closely, and we've got to um, look for those successes. We will ultimately be doing this because it's being driven by the, um, the requirements of legislation. And as I say, we've got to create ways of doing this commercially and perhaps a bit of government incentive. So, concluding, maybe we should take the Yangtze experience and bring it in to local vessels in pilot schemes. That will create some of the infrastructure that might allow us to be supporting box ships as these LNG-ready container ships, of which a number are being built at the moment, start to ply international trades. And then maybe ultimately in the future we'll catch up with even things like bulk carriers if they ever convert to that and commitment. And that will create the critical mass to support um, shipping as part of this global supply chain. Thank you very much.